All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Before we dive in today's episode, I want to thank you for tuning in and supporting the brand. Over the last few years, I spent a lot of time starting Farmer Grade. We offer meat that you and your family can trust by strictly sourcing our cuts from farmers who share their story and processes online through social media. We provide high quality beef and pork that is 100% born, raised, and harvested in the United States. If you want to support the content and the message we share online, I would appreciate it if you went over to farmergrade.com and you can use the code BARNTALK to save 10% off your next order. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. We love you. Now, let's get into the episode. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn, but not today. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is going to be a Q&A episode. You guys submitted your questions at barntalkshow at gmail.com, and we're going to answer them today. If you want to submit a question and you've never done it before, you can email us at barntalkshow at gmail.com, and that's where we'll get them. That's where we'll uh, receive the questions, and that's how we'll answer them on the show. You can also feel free to leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Uh, you can pay the fee and share it out with friends or family or whoever. The more you guys share the show, the more it grows, the better guests we can get on. Um, it's kind of kind of the ticket to admission to watch or listen to the show. Um, we have been doing a raffle in the last the past month. Uh, if you guys submitted uh, proof that you left a review on Spotify or Apple, we are going to throw you in a pork raffle, a pork box raffle, and we're going to send one free pork box out to somebody that did submit proof. I'm but, really excited about that because I put in like 25 dummy accounts. So <laughs> I deleted I'm, all your submissions. I've, oh, yeah, Damn you're it. out. You're out. Can't do that. Family family doesn't get this one. So um, only the Barn Talk family. All right. So I actually wanted to do do something a little bit different on that. I did. We're going to do two boxes instead of one, and we're going to do uh, one for Apple and one for Spotify. And I put these in a random generator last night when we were prepping for the show, and um, I just threw all the names in, and I hit generate a random winner and i did it twice did all the apple ones and all the spotify ones so our apple winner is matthew walker so i am going to email matthew get his address get all that stuff and we'll be sending you a free uh pork box from our farm straight to your door and then also we got um lane pearson both you guys we're gonna, i'm going to be reaching out to you thank you for submitting proof of your review we're going to keep that thing rolling so if you want a free meat box from farmer grade uh you can submit proof to barn talk show at gmail.com that you left a review on either spotify or apple we're trying to get those review numbers up uh thank you to all that submitted continue to submit and uh maybe you'll be the lucky winner next time so, so. the counter resets and we're going to do it again gosh dang I'm excited. That's awesome. No, yeah. but I mean, if you're going to get something free, might as well get a free box of meat. It, you can't get better than that. So, yeah, we'll be shipping these out Monday. So, you should receive them by next week if I can get your guys' information. But, yeah, thank you to all that have done that. I think we had over 150 submissions uh, of people submitting proof that they left a review. So, that's pretty awesome. That helps us grow. That helps us get our show more credibility and uh, more reach. So, thank you guys. Seriously. Let's face it, I need as much credibility as I can get, especially when I uh, introduce the chairman of the CCP as Emperor 9 instead of 11, because he's yeah. Xi, which is yeah. XI. I think it's Xi Jinping or something. There Xi you go, Jinping. that sounds good. Xi but Jinping. It's, X, it's XI, and I called it IX because yeah. I kept saying 9. I was trying to be humorous, but... Everybody makes mistakes, Ooh. Dad. I kind of got roasted hard Everybody on makes mistakes, yep. Yeah. That was in the last episode. Yep. Can't get everything right. Today, spot on. You're going to be flawless. Guaranteed spot on. We had Thanksgiving last night. Went really great. We made way too much food, and we got a lot of leftovers. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's not a bad thing. And it's not a bad thing until you get three days into eating leftovers, and you're about over it. So We had to round up all the loose Tupperware scattered amongst everybody. Uh, everybody actually had to run home and get their Tupperware uh 
except for a few people that were from further away. But uh, and then we basically sent them all back out again because we had yep. so much stuff. So we fried a turkey. Uh, we just had turkey as a uh, experiment because we haven't fried one in a long time. And then ham balls. It's easy to experiment when you have ham balls as your backup. Yep. Because we knew we were golden because if all else failed, uh, I would rather have ham balls anyway. But the turkey actually turned out pretty good. Uh, I was a little, I was a little scared when I pulled it because uh, it was pretty crusty. But uh, it was, man, it was good. Yeah, was I liked juicy. it. Dark meat, dark meat's the best on a turkey. Yep. Turkey's not great warmed up though. Sawyer uh, hoarded. Sawyer hoarded all the uh, the legs, the turkey legs. He yeah. looked like a Viking. Yeah, I did. Chawing on that. Yeah, I sent it. Yeah, I did. I, I always like. Uh, yeah, it's just easy to eat turkey off a of turkey leg, and I feel like that's one of the best parts of the turkey. So I just I grabbed that sucker and put it on my plate, and I tried picking it off with a fork to be polite, but after a while, it just just start eating it like a Viking, <laughs> you know? Yep. Just send it. Who cares? Yep. So our our uh, Thanksgiving game, I feel like was a little weak. We we hit the charcuterie board a little too hard because I think Sawyer was the only one that got two plates of food. I I just couldn't do it. It was all I could do after uh, after dinner. We played some poker for a while, and then we sat down to watch a movie. And uh, I did muscle up enough strength for ice cream and a brownie, but uh, it was tough. Didn't get to the pie. Didn't get to the pie. Did not get to the pie. I couldn't believe I was the only one that got up for seconds. And, oh, I probably should not have gotten up for seconds because when I got done eating that, I was – my stomach felt like it was going to explode, but I always do that every year on Thanksgiving. It comes once a year, man. You got to just you got to just power through and eat as much food as you possibly can. I feel like you just so got to. He was on a mission. He was he would not be deterred. He was going to power through. But yeah. I'm surprised. Actually, I think uh, Mom was the only one that uh, she started to doze off during the movie. Everybody else made it through the movie, but anyway. All good. So we hope all of you had a good Thanksgiving. And now uh, we're up. We're doing the podcast. We need a little bit of coffee. And uh, we got wiener pigs coming about, I don't know, in a couple hours. So back at it. Got to go. So you want a market update? I do. All right. I think uh, everybody else does too. The market update is slightly delayed because there was no overnight trade uh, and the market actually opens at 8.30 this morning. We're shooting a little earlier than that. So these numbers, courtesy of Cat's Grain in Washington, Iowa, Cat's Grain, uh, they'll, they'll help you out if you're looking to market your crop. Uh, corn, 470. Uh, that's local, 479 uh, on the board. And Cedar Rapids has a bit of 493. I put stuff in a different order, and it kind of threw me. So... Uh, beans 1377 at the river. Um, nope, 1377 is what they closed. I should not have done that. River 1344 and Quincy, Illinois 1375. Wheat 555. Hog 68 bucks. So the futures market going right back down. We thought when we were going to get to a new month, the hog market was going to pop up a little bit. Got up about. $70, $71, and now right back down again. Wiener pigs, 28 bucks. So a few weeks ago, we talked about the, the hog business a little more in depth, and wiener pigs were about 10 bucks, and they've worked up to about 28 But when your cost of production on a wiener pig is about 40 bucks, uh, still no bueno. Cattle, 175 Feeder cattle, 228 Oil, $77. That probably will go up because a uh, tanker, a British tanker that had a partial ownership from an Israeli company uh, got pirated off the coast of Yemen. So the Yemenites have decided that they're going to... That's probably not That's what they not are. right, probably. Sounds good, though. They're the Hushis, I think. Hushis is yeah. the offshoot of them that are... Let's just say people from Yemen. Well, yeah, they're Yemen rebels that are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause because the video that they shot... Uh, taken over the ship. One of them was wearing a Palestinian flag hat, so they were all about it. Anyway, so that scare will probably send the uh, oil market up a little bit today, and I haven't heard whether they're still in control of that tank or not. Uh, Bitcoin, $37. 
Raul Paul says that thirty seven dollars. Thirty seven thousand. Sorry. There you go. Thirty seven thousand uh, dollars. Raul Paul says Crypto Spring is here. So we've been in crypto winter for a long time, and supposedly things are going to get a little better. Ethereum two thousand. Tesla. Uh, two hundred forty-one dollars. Cybertruck's going to get uh, announced. I think the thirtieth. I think that's right. There's a few of them around at showrooms across the country, and uh, you'll be able to get yourself one if you want one before long. Gold two thousand dollars and silver twenty-one seventy-nine. There you go. And we'll see. Uh, not much will happen today because a lot of people that trade are probably. Uh, their heart probably ain't in it, but Monday, we'll see what direction everything goes. Well, I got the first question for you if you're ready for it. Yep. Warm up. Get the fingers ready. Uh, Zach asks, I raise pasture poultry and swine on non-GMO grains. Some customers see this as a must, but I have a feeling the majority of the public does not care about non-GMO. I think that there might be a disconnect between online noise and actual customers that are brought in because I use non-GMO grain. Do you guys see the public shifting to non-GMO grains, or will conventional always be dominant over non-GMO and organic? I think, your, I think your thoughts are right in the fact that I think there's a lot of noise out there that it's a big deal, but at the end of the day, people that are buying food, the number one thing is probably taste and value um and there's so many buzzwords that are thrown around in the in the food world and i'm to pick on the egg market is a good example because you go look at eggs if you just stand in the egg aisle there are what pasture raised free range cage free cage free uh, veg, fed a vegetarian diet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's all these buzzwords, and I think the average consumer has... It all sounds good, but they're not all... It, it's not the same, and at the end of the day, I think if you quiz those people, they don't really understand how those, how those birds are raised. And I think the GMO question, I don't even trust that in the fact that... Like, when you think about corn... Um, we used to raise non-GMO corn around here because there used to be a pretty good premium uh, taking it to the river. And there still are years that they have good contracts for it. But you really have to ask yourself, uh, with all the way corn matures, it's pollinated. So corn is self-pollinating. But when you think about you have a field of non-GMO corn and on three sides of you, you have somebody else that's growing conventional corn. And you harvest all that corn, you put it in a bin, you keep it separate, and then you haul it to the river. And out of a thousand bushel load, they take a coffee can sample and they test it. They may take three coffee can samples if it's non GMO. I don't know how they do it, but they're not sampling that load as it's unloaded. So, the idea that at the end of the day that that corn or those beans go get processed and everything comes out of them is non-GMO, uh, I'd say that's probably not true because I guarantee you there's some of that corn or soybeans that got pollinated by GMO that just isn't being tested, just not being caught. And so then you ask the question of, okay, all this GMO that gets saved... It, at this point in the ball game across the United States, how much corn do you think that is actually true non-GMO and how much of it is labeled non-GMO but has GMO in it? I have no idea, but I'll bet you that it's not as pure as anybody that's trying to sell that idea claims it to be. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd also say what makes it confusing for consumers is you'll have a product that has no doesn't even have corn in it or you know it'll have a product and it'll say non-gmo on it. right and it has nothing in Noth it. nothing in it that would even have gmos in it 
and they still just put that claim on there because it's a buzzword. It's yep. a label. And I think the consumer is more health conscious, no doubt about it. And you can get into the argument if GMOs are bad for you or if they're not. I'm not going to do that here today. Do your own research. But I think people, it's back to what you said. I think people are confused. People don't know. Some people buy into it and buy it. Some people are like, eh, this is just another marketing ploy to get me to pay an extra dollar on my bread or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, but the other thing that I think right now, especially times are hard. Times are hard. And, uh, people, <laughs> when times get tough and grocery bills go up, people don't give less of a shit about that kind of stuff. Yep. And they're just trying to feed their families and get by and make it survive. So they're not going to pay an extra dollar if they don't have to. And they're not, they're not going to give the time of day to that kind of shit, I think. Right. I think that's kind of where we're at right now as a country is people are just, they're budgeting, they're doing their numbers, and they're going to hit their budget numbers on their grocery bill, and they're not going to pay a dime more for something that, I don't know, for me on the scale of importance, I think probably non-GMO for the consumer right now, if you're trying to budget, is probably not up there as a priority. Right. You know what I mean? So that's also working against it. Um, so yeah, I, that's my two cents on it. I don't know. It could be something, it's just probably one of those things, you know, it ebbs and flo flows with how people are feeling in the country. Maybe right now, non-GMO corn is not, or non-GMO products isn't doing as hot as it does when we're thriving as a country, mm -hmm. you know, just like any market, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to say what the best thing for you to do uh, is, but I, I honestly believe that what we've seen from just what we do, you know, showing people what you do and telling them the why, telling them the how, all that stuff is more important than just throwing a claim on, I think. Yeah. We're yeah. all about throwing these claims on, but nobody's showing people what the fuck that actually means. And if you're one of the few people that shows what that actually means, whether you raise non-GMO corn or you do raise GMO corn, I think most people will understand why and how, and they'll respect you for it, and they'll be more inclined to buy a product from you and trust you because you're open about it versus yeah. going to the grocery store and just being like, well, I have no idea who raised this. I don't even know what this means. Somebody just threw this claim on there. Right. You know? Um, yeah, I think with what you said about claims-based, this whole claims-based food is to the point where people think they can sell a product with no background, no, you don't know how it was raised, where it was raised, what was done to it, but it has claims on it. They think that that's going to sell it for them, and it's not. And the, what I wanted to go back to was kind of the start of all this, to my knowledge, was years ago, and I don't know if it was Purdue or if it was Tyson or who it was, they started selling chicken, and they said hormone-free. The problem is no chicken no chicken got hormones. Like nobody was putting hormones trying to, as a growth promoting in chicken. Nobody was. But they just, it came up at a marketing meeting. Somebody's like, yeah, that's a good idea, and they put it on there, and it took off. They got traction from it because people are like, oh, that's a good idea. I don't want chicken that has hormones in it. Well, no chicken does, but they market it, and You've seen that. It's the now. same thing with antibiotics. It's the same yeah. thing with all of it. And when you talk about when you talk about um, animals being fed a vegetarian diet, I mean that's that sounds whatever. Well, yeah, I just gotta say to anybody out there that doesn't know this, because you'd be surprised at how many people we see in comments or how many people we see in emails. They ask, "Are your animals we raise pigs on our farm fed corn?" And soybeans, or are they fed, fed grass? Pigs cannot grow and survive on just eating grass. Right. The only animal that can do that that's predominant in the meat industry, really predominant, is cattle. They can be a 100% grass-fed. If you want to do that, it takes a while. It takes a lot, that long. Yeah, it takes a lot longer, <laughs> but they can. Chickens, poultry, and pigs cannot. They have got to have some grain to eat. And they can eat some grass, whatever, but that's not what's going to grow the animal. That's not what's going to make the animal survive. So yeah. just putting that out there for anybody that does not know that. Yeah. 
So uh, at the end of the day, I think you're spot on. Yeah. I think how I think telling your story for you, telling your story, showing people what you do, why you do it, is probably more way more important to the success of selling your product than making the claim. Um, now, if they're you know if you show people why you do what you do and where you get your non-GMO product and who you work with and all that. There may be a market for that, and you may be able to you may be able to leverage that to your advantage. But I do feel like our society is so overloaded with claims and labels, and it's confusing. It's not clear to the point that a lot of people are just like, I don't know, whatever. And I'm yeah. gonna vote with my pocketbook. Yeah, um, I don't know for whatever reason we're here. We're, we're it's just kind of a long one, but for whatever reason in the food industry. In meat industry, like we're one of the very few products out there that consumers buy that just like the br the brand building behind these food companies, the brand building behind these these comp these brands that you see on the sh store, grocery store shelves, terrible, like just terrible. Like you look at all the products that consumers buy today. If you're a brand outside of meat or food. And there are food businesses and meat businesses that are branding and doing a better job. But, like, most don't. They just are like, yep, we're going to just throw this claim on there and we're going to get in some grocery stores and we're going to put this product on the shelf and consumers are just going to buy it. I think that those days are numbered. And I think, I don't know how we even got went down that road and thought that that was just what we're going to start doing. We should have been showing people what we do from the beginning like every other company does and every other brand does in any other industry, like, yeah. hey, this is how we make our product. This is what it looks like, yada, yada, yada. Um, we're going to put a label on there. And, and just hope gonna, people buy it. And we're going to put a picture of a red barn yeah. on a green field. It's bullshit. To represent <laughs> where your meat came And from. I mean, the consumer did buy it. You can't fault them for it. But it's like, I think those days are numbered. People, yeah. people are wanting to know. People are more skeptic than ever before. And they want to know, like, okay, cool, your your fucking package has a red barn on it, but yeah. what what is Did it? Did it come from that? Yeah, what are you claim this and this and that, but what does that even fucking mean? Let me Who's see. Who's actually raising yeah. this meat for you? Yeah, who? What farm is this coming from? So that's that's where I think it's headed, and it needs to head that way. I think. So. So this one ties kind of into that because we're still on talking about food and produce and all that. Matthew asks, with some uh, cash crops, he uses fruit, spices, berries, uh, going for, uh, he's Canadian, uh, basically the equivalent of $20 a pound, $20 a pound. And being from a Providence that values giving their neighbor, uh, their dollars over a foreign entity, it seems like a good, uh, a good idea to try it. I was just curious what you guys know or have to say about cash crops. Yeah. So, he doesn't do it. He's no, thinking he's about thinking doing about it. it. Yeah. I don't know much about cash crops. All I'd say is, um, y'all leave. You got a good point on this, but I also do too. This is one of those things that uh, there's no crop insurance for this kind of stuff for us anyway on cash crops like this. Um, and also, this is one of those things that it's it's a market. So if the opportunity looks really good right now. Just know it might not look good in three to five years. You know, it's just like everything. It's just like the price of corn. You know, it's just like everything. The demand of stuff changes. The demand of stuff goes up and down. The price goes up and down. And just keep that in mind. Like, it might look like a great opportunity right now, uh, but it could change. And if you're not, if you go all in on this, and because the prices are good right now, and then in three years they go to shit, and you you're leveraged or you can't you can't withstand that you're going to go out of business so you know i would just recommend really do your research on this really really make sure that you can you this is feasible for you for the long term not just right now you know um because shit shit changes and you got to be ready for that change and you got to i'm not saying don't take action cuz i'm all about people taking action and doing shit you know instead of just sitting there planning and planning and planning but farming's farming's a tough business no matter what you're raising and it changes rapidly markets change so just 
just make sure that if you go into this, you, you do it the right way, do it the smart way. Make sure you know your shit. So my my two cents on it all is where we live, uh, southeast Iowa, there are people that have blueberry farms and uh, pumpkin patches and um, specialty crop. Uh, a lot of them are close to bigger, bigger cities where they do the farmer's market thing. And what to me what sticks out is you do not if you're going to do that you either better have access to a good amount of flexible labor part-time labor or you got a bunch of kids or if you're going to do it specialty crop farming is not one of those businesses that you can probably do as a side hustle at a very big scale so if you're already farming and you're thinking about starting that that's a lot of time and it's going to take you're going to have to feed it you got to feed it to start and so whether that means that somebody else in the family's got an off-farm job or you're doing something else to help get that started and that's that's tough like where we are that's tough with labor and then the other thing is um we've got we've got friends, neighbors that have pumpkin patches. And this last year in Iowa was a piss poor year to have a pumpkin patch or really anything uh, because it was so dry. And unless you had irrigation set up, you didn't have a very good crop. And, you know, if you get a bad year starting out, you can go backwards in, in a hurry. And one last thing I'll say is this. One of the luxuries of grain farming at scale and we're small scale but still at scale is when i market that product i have multiple i have three four five six places that i can take that crop but i mostly deal with just two so i have two people that i have to deal with and i don't have to see any of them i load it on a truck haul it to their facility dump it and they send me a check. If you're getting into that kind of production and you can't, you're not where you can work with a wholesaler, you're now working with a consumer and just even more work. It's a lot of work because those consumers, it's not like dealing with one entity. Every one of those consumers is different. Every one of those consumers is going to have a different reaction and a different expectation. And you're going to hear about all of them. So it's the reward is greater. So when you talk about, you know, $20 a pound, you could make, that's a lot of money off of a small amount of land. It's also a lot more intensive on labor and on marketing. Marketing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you just got to do your do, do your due diligence. Talk to other, if you can talk to, Excuse me, if you can talk to other people that have done it or are doing it, that's even better because most people that are that are farming, that are doing something, if they're successful at it, they're excited about it, they like to share. They like to tell you what they're doing, what what works, what doesn't. Find those guys and, you know, do your homework before you jump in. This is a good one uh, because I didn't do anything on this. So <laughs> <laughs> lessons learned from the six the first six months of starting farmer grade first thing i would say i wouldn't be able to do any this business would not have worked if i did not have my family and my friends to help me out on occasion because i had we had to pack orders and i couldn't pack all the orders that i packed without my family and all that stuff but um i guess it's not just like specific to just farmer grade i think it's lessons learned just starting any business um this business is fucking hard like that's the biggest thing that, you know, I feel like we're sold this bag of goods in this day and age now. If you're young and you're ambitious, like entrepreneurship's the way. It's the only way you should work for yourself, yada, yada, yada. And I I bought into that and I love, I love entrepreneurship. Don't get me wrong. But don't buy the idea that this is just going to be, oh, you're going to set up your store. You're going to set up your website. You're going to create this brand and you're just going to kill it because it's, it's, it's a dog, it's, it's a dog fight, you know, like every day it's demanding everything, every day it demands something of you. 
and um, nobody's going to make it happen besides you. And so you have to you have to show up every day and you have to try to improve the business every day and you have to try to think about what's the number one um, problem that I'm facing today or number one problem that I'm facing in the business that we have to solve and you got you to gotta figure it out. It's all on you to figure it out. And you, I'm lucky enough to have a great support system that I can talk to my dad, that I can talk to people, get their two cents on things, kind of just tell them what I'm dealing with. And sometimes they got something good to give you and sometimes they're just there to say, well, you'll figure it out, you know, for yeah. moral support, you so, know. So the... That's really good, but I always feel bad because sometimes you call me and you're like, yeah, I got this, da 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 and you get to the end, and instead of giving you, oh, well, just do this, I go, I have no freaking idea, <laughs> yeah. because it's not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about raising pigs, we're not talking about, you know, selling something, you're totally out of my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. and that's when... We're all like, you'll get it. You'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Which is better than, better than, oh, I don't, yeah, I would just quit. You know, I'm glad that I have people in my corner that support me, even if they don't have the necessarily the answer, they have some support to just get me through. But, um, there, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I'm just right now. It's just tough because I think the hardest thing about business is that holds businesses back from growing is the lack of knowing what to do next. And like right now, the struggles that I'm going through is like, so we, we've sold, we've successfully sold some of the product, right? We, it, it, I feel like the, the proof of the concept has worked. Yes. Like I have a proof of concept. Enough people have bought it. Enough people seem to, to enjoy the product. Um, and you know, we're making some money, you know, but that's great. Now I got to take those dollars and I got to, put them to work for me and put them inside the business and, you know, try to grow the business, whether that be warehouse, uh, equipment, supplies, whatever. Right. But then also I got, I got to build a team and I, and I don't know shit about building a team. I know I need good people to build a great business, but when, what's the right hire? What's the first, what's the best first hire to make? When do you hire that person? Do you have to have a year, a year of, their salary saved up before you hire that person? You know, all these questions that go into your head of like, what's the next step? Who do I hire first? You know, those kind of things. And what's got what's gotten me this far is just going and slipping up and just keep going and learning from my mistakes. So I might make a hire that I wasn't supposed to, but we'll just have to keep pushing forward and I'm going to keep learning and making mistakes. But that's just the hardest part is you got to figure it out yourself. You got to do the work and it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm not doing this to deter anybody from going out on their own and trying something because I've learned so much just like talking to people, how the meat industry works, how the meat business works, uh, working with consumers, email marketing, customer support, you know, all that shit, I had no idea how to do any of that stuff. And I've learned all of it just because I had to out of necessity. So you learn a lot of just skills by just doing something new. Um, but it's all on you to figure it out. So um, just know that the game is not as easy as like all the gurus want to tell you it is. If anybody's out there telling you that becoming an entrepreneur and becoming a, a business owner is fucking easy. Oh, it's a piece of cake. You'll make 100K in a, less than a year. Yeah, they're probably feeding you a bunch of bullshit and want you to buy their course. So just know that. So two questions. Of everything that you've gone through starting this, what would you say has either been a lot easier than you thought it was going to be or has worked, like you've seen it work better or faster than you thought it would? Then the other thing would be what has, way, what has been way harder than what you thought it would be? Okay, I would say I'll answer the second question first. Like, you know, we we build up this brand and all this stuff first, right? Before we ever thought about even starting farm grade. The 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 support from the audience and the the questions from the audience like of you know, our audience from This Will Do Farm asking us where can we buy your guys' meat? That's kind of what sparked the idea to even do this thing. And I just felt like, oh, we we're going to be able to sell like, I just think I had this 
high expectations. Oh, we're going to be able to sell thousands and thousands. We're going to sell out in minutes. Yeah, we're going to sell out in days. You know, when we do these drops, we're going to sell out days. And we sold out on our first one. No, and the second one, it's been a little bit slower, but every customer matters and it's not easy to just get somebody to actually buy a product from you. It's not easy. I thought it was going to be easier than what it was, but it's, it's not, it's not super easy. So that's been not saying we haven't had success doing that. We have, we have, we have made great customer relations. We've, we've sold to people, but I thought it would be a little bit more. And I think that's just lack of that's just being me being new to this whole direct to consumer thing, and you know, being an optimist. and being an optimist, thousand um, percent. And then the second thing, what was easier? What went better than you thought it would, or or yeah, was easier than you thought it would be? Nothing. <laughs> just I would say honestly, the relationships that I have formed with lockers, farmers, and um, suppliers of the stuff that we need to use every day yeah like i met an amazing woman shout out to denise that provides all the liners and boxes for us and when i initially started my my packaging cost was way higher than what it is now and the boxes were shittier quality than what what the ones that i have now are and I got in touch with this woman, Denise, and she gives me these, she, she's from New York, and she's <laughs> awesome, and uh, she got me way better liners and way better boxes at a lower price than what I initially got, and I met that, met her through a, a mutual connection, and it's just, it's crazy finding the right people like that. You think it's, oh, it's going to be such a challenge to find a great supplier for all my warehousing stuff. It it you just gotta ask around and then you make the phone call and yeah. it turns out that person's awesome. They can really help you tremendously in your business. And so I just feel like all all the people that I work that farm we do work with inside Farmer Grade have been amazing to work with. And my first time starting this whole thing, when I was first trying to find a fulfillment center or or a or a, a meat locker to work with. I was getting shut down left and right. And I was like, man, people are not very nice inside this industry. Like it's really hard to even get, get knowledge on what to do. Yep. But then you find the right people and it's easier than what you think. Yeah. So just keep looking for sure. So I'd say that that's, those are the kind of the two things. I don't know. That was kind of a long one. Uh, kind of ranted there. There's a lot of shit I've learned, but the journey is not as easy as what everybody wants to tell you. Just know that. It's not as easy as everybody wants to tell you. And if you want it, I think I think when people say you got to be passionate about it to make it as far as whatever business you start, you got to have some passion behind it. I would agree with that. Because if you don't have enough passion behind it, you're not going to stick through the shit. Yeah. You're not going to stick it out through the shit. Because there's always going to be shit no matter what business you start. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. And if you got no fire in you to say, well, we'll just get through it. I'll figure it out. You'll quit way before yep. you'll quit way before you stick it out. You got to have some fire. So there's a lot and there's been a lot of great accomplishments along the way. And just for me, you know, helping you the day that we loaded the first UPS truck when we had like 200 boxes, yeah. there's something there's something pretty cool. And, you know, more cool for you, but me even, there is something pretty damn cool about starting a product, designing a website, designing a box, filling that box with your product, and then you get the delivery, you know, UPS comes, and that whole freaking truck was just loaded with farmer grade boxes. Mm -hmm. That roll-up door, just full. And when that thing pulled out of the bay of the warehouse, that that's a pretty good feeling. Yeah, it is a pretty cool moment. Uh yeah, it is. And then, and then terror. Because yeah, like, that's God, the problem. There. <laughs> that's that's the other problem. Like you, you go through these chain of events, and you're like, okay, that's done, that's done, that's done, that's done. That feels good. And then you're like, okay, now it's got to show up to the customer's door, intact, frozen, and in good shape. Yep. And then, then I can breathe a little bit. Yep. <laughs> then I can breathe a little bit. So that is, but it is cool. I, 
that's what I enjoy more than anything is the, it is a very cool process. If anybody's ever done this, everybody, anybody listens, ever done this to have an idea, make it happen, and then actually have real customers enjoying your product. It's a pretty cool feeling. You know, it's like, it makes you feel like, okay, all this work is for something, you know, it is for something. Yeah. So, because some days you feel like, fuck, is this all worth it? You know, <laughs> am I doing this? Is this the right thing to do? But no, it is. It's definitely rewarding. So anyway, okay, we'll move on. Hey, thanks for sticking with us. We appreciate every single one of you guys. Let's keep this ball rolling. Leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Follow us on YouTube. Uh, pay the fee. Share it out with who you know. It all helps, guys. We appreciate every single one of you. We love you. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Seth asks, hey guys, it's been a while since I listened to the episode, listen to the podcast, and can't remember which one it is. You guys talked about crypto wallets, and I wanted to look into them without going through and listening again. Could you remind me which, got, which ones you guys recommend? I believe that there was two. Yeah, so um, the two that we talked about on that episode was the Trezor and the, uh, what did I say? Ledger. Mm -hmm. uh, Ledger Nano. Uh, Ledger and Trezor are, at least they were, the biggest. And I'll be honest, I use a Trezor. And I actually have two of them. And when I got it, I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about how to send, store crypto. Um, and full disclosure, you know, I've got some Bitcoin, I've got some Cardano, I've got some Ethereum, and I literally just started moving it around. Um, so I opened a Coinbase account, and I think this is a this is an important point for people that are getting into crypto or if you're in there just a little bit and you have like a Coinbase account or you have a Gemini account or Binance or whatever. So they have, those sites all have an what they call an online wallet, which is your, your digital wallet. But it's to me, and this is a saying that, that, you know, people in the crypto world talk about. It's like, if it if it's not your keys, it's if, not your crypto. Yeah, if it's not your keys, it's not your crypto. And by keys, they mean these these wallets, either the online wallet or the hardware wallet. But what they're talking about is the on, is the hardware wallet. If you aren't if you aren't keeping your crypto offline in a hardware wallet, is it really yours? And because they have these like. 12 word pass phrases. I actually don't know if they're 12 words or not. I can't remember, but it's a bunch of words. Um, so you feel very secure, you know, uh, setting that up, but then most of them have your password to get into it. You don't have to use all those, you don't have to use that passphrase to get in it if you got your face ID enabled and all that. Well, you're running the risk that either A, that exchange could go down and you could lose your crypto, or it could get hacked. How likely that is, I don't know. But if you take that and you put it in a hardware wallet, and you are storing it, and when you unplug that hardware wallet off of the cord that it's connected to your computer, nobody can touch it. Nobody can get it. And I was, believe me, I was about as greenhorned as there could be of anybody when I got one. Um, but I moved, I bought crypto off of, um, Coinbase and I bought crypto off of, um, what's the other Binance? Not, no, what's PayPal? The other, not PayPal, Cash but App. Cash App. I bought a lot of Bitcoin on Cash App and then transferred it to my hardware wallet. So I bought different places and transferred it all to my treasure and i have it that way and i've also sh i've also sold where i've transferred it from my uh hardware wallet onto an exchange sold it 
and then had the money wire transferred to my bank account. And I've done vice versa. When I was buying, I would transfer money from, from a bank account onto the server, onto the uh, Coinbase, and buy it, and I moved it around. And you know what? Once you get used to it, it's really, really simple. And what's amazing to me is how fast uh, those transactions are and how cheap they are. Um, you're talking a little bit of nothing to move thousands of dollars worth of crypto or to move the cash uh, to your account. So um, those are the two I use. There's some really fancy ones out there. There's new ones. Um, I think the biggest... So Ledger, they got their ass in a bind a few years ago because somebody hacked their system and they got their email list. They weren't able to get into anybody's because once you get the hardware wallet and you put your password in it, it's yours. And nobody, not even them, can get into it. Although people are worried that somehow they've got a back door in them that they could. But even then, the only way they could get into it was if they were looking for your wallet at a time that you had it connected to the network, which is pretty rare. Like for me, I hardly ever have mine on. Um, once in a while, I'll hook it up. Uh, just to get it updated as far as what the prices are, but very rarely because I'm mostly just a buy and hold guy. I I don't I don't use it a lot for payments and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, long story short, if you're gonna play in crypto, I would highly highly recommend that you get a hardware wallet. And the best way to do it is to start and transfer little amounts, you know, because it doesn't matter. You could transfer $3 and get some crypto on exchange and then get your wallet set up and then transfer a little bit. And once you get used to it, it's it's super easy. So those are the two that I know the best. And like I said, I use a Trezor. I have two of those because I have one that is a backup to the other one. And uh, yeah. That's what I know. Kelly asks, any farmer grade specialty boxes? Um, I would say we're going to try to work with more uh, well-known farm creators here in 2024. Um, got some people that I'm thinking of that I'd love to be able to partner with and, you know, have their farm provide some, some cattle or pigs or whatever. And uh, that'll be really cool. But also I'm trying to get like a, I know a lot of people like, you know, pork loins and briskets and pork butts and, I'm trying to think up a box that I could do to have kind of those smoke, like a smoker bundle. Um, but it's just really hard when you're yeah. taking only 40 pigs at a time and you don't yield those kind of cuts. There's not a lot of those cuts to go around. Um, so you wouldn't have a ton of boxes. Yeah. Um, so that's the hard part. But I'm working on it. The more volume that we can crank out with Farmer Grade, the more variety that I'll be at, we'll be able to offer customers as far as bundles and drops and that kind of thing. Um, it's just, we got to get those numbers up before I can offer all the cuts, you know? So it's kind of where I'm at. It's coming. Um, but it's, it's gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have to keep her, keep her moving before we can get to that place, I think. But specialty boxes, I would definitely say more farm partners like Sony Farms coming very soon, um, where they'll have their own box on Farmer Grade. So that's all I can say for now. Um, Peter asks, why don't you guys bail your corn stocks? You can get up to $60 per bale, Torque. <laughs> right. What the fuck? Right. Uh, I, so my off the cuff answer to that is, um, I have no desire to mess with it, but I don't have a baler. Uh, I don't have any of the stuff it takes to do it. You can hire that all done. Um, and there's guys around here that have cattle that bail a shitload of stocks. Like, it is Hundreds. insane. We've got a couple of our neighbors that have got confinement cattle lots, and holy cow, I mean, when they start bailing, it's just like, and I just look at that, I'm like, somebody's got to move every one of them bales, and then they put it on a trailer, and then they haul it, and I mean, they just, um, so we're not set up for that. But my other my other deal, and I think a lot, I, I don't know, I guess I, I feel like 
people probably know this, but maybe they don't. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of nutrient value after harvest that are in those stocks that as they break down into your soil, those nutrients become available. And when you are constantly baling and taking that off, you're you're pulling nutrients off of that. Like that bale isn't free. Basically what I'm saying is that bale isn't free to you. Yes, you can make $80 off of it, but what's the value of those stocks if they stay on your field? Both in organic value and in nutrient value. I don't know. Somebody way smarter than me can probably throw that number out, leave it in the comments, but it's a number. And um, for us on our farm, we've tried really hard to work on our, our organic material to grow that and to do better about leaving that residue uh, to help our soil hold better. And so it doesn't really fit what we're doing and we're not doing anything with cattle. Um, you know, it's one of those things. I guess if time gets tough and somebody wanted to buy them that was a cattle feeder, we might look into it. But right now. Uh, my only thing on that is time. Yes. We don't have enough time. I We are maxed out on time. We do not need another thing to do right now where we're at. Unless we got some maybe some awesome farm hands to help us out, which we can't even do that right now. I do not see us jumping on another opportunity at the moment. So yep. that's, <laughs> leave that for somebody, somebody else to do. You can't do it all. And focusing on one thing and doing that very well will serve you pretty well is what I have been told and what I've learned and kind of we're trying to follow that a little bit more because it's really easy to go money. It's always greener over here, always greener over here. We should do this. We should do that. We should do this. We should do that because you see a need in the marketplace. But you get started playing whack-a-mole. Yeah. If your time and your energy is spread out between a million things, you're not going to do very, all of them good at all. Yeah. So focus on a couple things. Focus on one thing. Yep. And we're trying to do that trying to work to towards doing that more so what's your favorite gun this is kind of i like this question when it came up because it it's just random amongst all the stuff that was in there what's my your favorite, favorite gun? gun uh i'm not probably the most knowledgeable gun connoisseur but i mean the one that probably the nicest one we have and the one that i like to fire is an ar-15 i mean that's yeah. awesome those are awesome to have awesome to shoot, uh, great defense weapon, great overall, great weapon, and it's yeah. smooth. It fires nice. Uh, it's just fun. They're got fun. Got a nice sight. Got a nice sight. Got Dad. a EOTech. Yep. Sight on it. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like a basic bitch right now, but <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> you know that's I, I don't know that's that's a, I we don't I would love to actually have our own gun range. You know, one day I think that'd be really fun, and I think shooting guns is, can be therapeutic because you are yeah. focusing. Uh, but back to the time thing, we don't have a lot of time for hobbies. It yeah. seems like so, but that is something that I would love to do more of: is go to the firing range and shoot some guns and get some more guns and do that kind of thing because I I do enjoy doing it. I would second that. I mean, the the easiest, smoothest, most dependable gun I think that. I have and and I I've got a 308 version of an AR and um I really like it. It's heavy. It's a lot better for Sawyer to mess around with than me because it's just heavier, but it'll you know, you start getting to that um I've got my old uh buddy of mine I've got his uh 30-06 uh, bold action hunting rifle. That's a cool gun. Got a really nice scope on it. Um, but they're like Sawyer said, it's like, gosh, I, I would go, I would love to go to the range more often and just play around, but we just don't have the time. I think probably the coolest gun as far as one that I really want, um, is still a SIG MPX, which is like a nine millimeter, miniaturized version of an AR like it 
It's kind of built like a tiny AR and no recoil, um, you know, 30, 40 round clips for it. And they're very dependable. You can just, you can just run, you can run ammo through them like crazy. Uh, love those things. But you know what? The other thing is we talk about going to the range. This freaking ammo has gotten so expensive. It's like you don't want to waste yeah, it. Yeah, it's like, gosh, dang. You you really hate to waste it. And then, you know, a few episodes back, we talked about, you know, government cutting off selling privately from the lake uh, armory or the ammunition plant. And there's been some ammunition plants that have gotten shut down. Uh, there's some anu- ammo manufacturers that have been bought by uh, foreign companies. So it's like, man, it's, I'm glad I've got the guns I've got. I just hope that we're all able to keep getting ammo for all of them. So, um, I hope that, I hope that answers you. I'm not even going to go down the, the pistol, uh, world. Um, a lot of nice pistols out there. Yeah. There are a lot of nice. Pistols and I would say there. pistols are fun to shoot. Yeah. They are fun to shoot. My buddies, uh, shout out to Sean and Thomas. They, uh, they got some pistols, and we don't have. I I don't have one. I'd like to get one. Uh, but taking those to the range and firing them off are fun. Yeah. I don't know exactly what what kind they have. Um, I forget. It's been a while, but they're fun. Yeah. I hope that. I hope that kind of answers your question. Uh, we're blood love. We're 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 God feared Americans. <laughs> <laughs> we love. You know. Yeah. It's fun. Don't get me wrong. And I there's probably some people listening to the show that are like, oh God. We're not, we're not, we don't have like, there's, we don't have like a bunker or nothing like that. Not we're, not, we're not quite to Wrangler Stars level, you know, so <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, you know, we're not doomsday preppers by any means, but I don't know. I think, uh, in trying times, I think it's important for everybody to be able to defend themselves. Yeah, That's, I would agree. The bottom line is, uh, as an American, you should be able to take care of yourself in a situation where, there is a struggle where something has gone wrong and there is a problem with society or I think problem with your family. Somebody's trying to hurt your family. Uh, yeah, you need to be able to defend that, defend you and your family. No doubt about it. And I believe that's one of the strongest rights that we have as an American is the right to defend ourselves. Yeah. And I, you know, it's a reason they put that in the, you know, they put that in the constitution, uh, yeah, there's a reason. Hundred percent, because they knew tyrants. They tyrants. Know, can, everybody that came to this country that that signed that had experience with tyrants, with people taking control of your lives that you had no ability. Or Ronald Reagan, and I'm going to slur this. Ronald Reagan. This is one of the best best analogies I've ever heard. He says, and I'm not sure if he said communism or socialism i can't remember off the top of my head but the gist of it was he said the problem with communism is you can vote yourself in but you have to shoot your way out (laughs) and that is a hundred percent true that is so true and it's amazing to me as a country how many rights we have just been so willing to just hand over and not even give it a second thought it's amazing to me that they wrote that so long ago, but they were so fucking smart about... Yeah. They just knew. They totally knew. We talk about this, though. The The thing is, throughout history, history changes, technologies change, human intention stays the same. Human intention... And, and it's the- almost maximized now because you can reach anybody and everybody, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like... You can have a lot of impact really fast with whatever intention you as a human want to The flawness, inflict. the flaws of men don't change. That's yeah. the thing. And so when they wrote that, they knew. They totally knew. that shit doesn't change. No. So anyway, uh, we'll do one more and okay. then, we're, then we're done. Okay. So Jensen asks, uh, he's from Denmark. Denmark likes to be the front runner in everything climate. As things are now, they're looking to enact a CO2 tax, as I understand it, mainly on animals. So I guess cows and after that pigs are going to get hit. Is that a thing in the U.S.? And 
and or do you fear that it will be? Oh boy, that's a lot. That's a that is a question there. I tell you, um, this this whole carbon environment thing, I'm conflicted on, and I think a lot of people feel the same way. I think the climate movement of climate activists and the world's gonna fucking melt and we're gonna lose we're gonna lose all our we're gonna we're gonna lose the world we're gonna destroy the world and we're the problem and everything's gonna fucking melt and the sky's falling that is the extreme that they want to shove down our throats and they want to tell us that we're the fucking problem and we got to solve it as fast as we possibly can and there's a lot of shit that like you know other countries probably don't do, you know, there's a lot of countries in this world and a lot of them probably don't do the best practices for the environment. If it's such a huge deal, the United States can't be the only one that tries to make a change. Uh, and the whole carbon thing, carbon credits, like there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with the carbon credit thing. But for agriculture, for industries inside the world that have a chance to sequester carbon and these people are going to pay these people that in these industries that can sequester carbon. Agriculture is one of those those industries that can do that. One of the best. One of the best industries that can do that. So that's where I get this conflict. On one end, I'm like, this all this shit is so extreme. And on the other, it's like, well, I don't know if we can do anything to stop it. And if it does come, agriculture is going to benefit if the right people... At, or at the top, um, like we got to, if, if it comes here to the United States, we got to have people that vouch for farmers and don't are smart enough to not do what they're doing over there. Yeah. Where it's the farmers are the enemies, get rid of the farmers, yep. destroy industry, destroy agriculture. Uh, that can't fly over here. We got to have, we got to do it a different way. We got to be, we got to have we got to put the farmers first in this matter for sure yeah and not destroy our industry and say farmers are the enemy you know and it goes to, it really plays into exactly what what we're doing and what a lot of people are doing as far as telling our story and showing what we do why we do it how we do it because i think that matters and i think i think it's helping um i think that People want to know. So on the one hand, I think you got a lot of consumers that are seeking that out. On the other hand, you have more farmers every day showing what we do and why we do it. But on that, on the carbon front, I think it is, I kind of have a different viewpoint because some people are like, they want nothing to do with it and they, they think it's all smoke and mirrors, which there's plenty of that out there. I look at it as an opportunity because, and I'll use the, I'll use the manure separation as a, as an example. So for us, if we can reduce the amount of water that we have to pump out of our wells, and we can reduce the amount of trips that we have to make across the field or down the road by taking the water out of the manure and eliminate all these all the, the gases that do come out of the pits and make the environment better for the pigs and for us working in there. If we could do all that and the manure and, would be better and the quality. carbon credits pay for that because people ask, Oh, what if you do this? And at the end of the deal, all these carbon credits go away. Well, my view on that is, if we can perfect this system and we can do it and we can use the carbon market to pay for what we're doing and at the end of it, the carbon market goes away, but we've got a system that we can do all those things, it's a huge win because it's all stuff we would like to do. The problem is today, you can't save, you can't save your way to profitability. You can't save enough money doing all this stuff to pay for the system. But if you can if you can play in the carbon markets, you can use that income to pay for what we're doing. And at the end of the day, it's better for everybody Then I'm on board with it. 
And I think that I think that what you're going to see, we just had a great conversation uh, with Continuum, Continuum Ag the other day. They're working on a carbon intensity program because coming out in 25, all of these uh, biofuel manufacturers have got to get a score on the grain that they're buying. And so they're basically looking to get to help people get a score for their farm. Uh, there's a lot more to come out on it, and I'm not going to try to talk about it knowledgeably because I just got the 50,000 foot view on it. But they're working on uh, basically coming up with a with a carbon intensity score for any grain farmer that wants to do that. But the demand for that isn't going to just be from biofuels. It's going to be from food companies that have made all these pledges that they are going to be, oh, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2028, or we're going to be carbon neutral by 2040, or whatever. Well, they're all waking up and they're realizing that they made these pledges and time's running and they haven't gotten very far. And the biggest thing that they can do is work with their number one supplier, which is the people they're supplying the raw ingredient to their product. Or if you're a meat, if you're somebody like, let's just say you're Smithfield, what's your biggest, what's your biggest input? The meat that goes to the product you're selling. You're still going to have to haul that product. You're still going to have to process that product. It's pretty hard to lower your carbon footprint at your factories and within your transportation. But if you can get guys that are doing what we're talking about on the manure side to where the animals you produce are carbon negative or carbon neutral, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity instead of us being taxed as farmers in the United States. We get incentivized. We're going to be incentivized and we're going to profit from it. Premiums. Now, we just like... That was a lot for us to strap on you. And at some point, we'll, we'll probably do a whole episode about this as we get closer because it's easy to talk about it. We haven't done it yet. We're getting close. We're going to get started here pretty quick. But uh, I guess that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> yeah, I, the CO2 tax thing. Uh, yeah, I just think we got to try to do our best at putting the power into the farmer's hand on this whole carbon deal for farmers to benefit we have to we got to be smart with how the program gets set up and who who's setting up these programs and who's kind of making this all work because if it's not going to be incentivized for the farmers well i i think that the i think that these companies are understanding in america at least that like you said they need the, they're going to need the farmers yep they can't villainize the farmer because they need the fucking farmer yeah. to make their carbon, to make their ESG go down and all their shit for their carbon score, yeah. for their, their pledge. Like, they're going to need us. So they would be stupid to villainize us and tax the living fuck out of us and make us go out of business because they, they need us. And um, us as farmers, stick in your... This goes to... Wait, this isn't just this. This is on everything. The days that you could rely on your commodity group or whoever else to tell your story and, and work in your behalf, that's great, but that's not enough. You can no longer stick your head in the sand and say, well, somebody else is going to do that. Somebody needs to, you know what? Somebody needs to talk to so-and-so. Somebody needs to do this. No, you're the somebody. Every one of us is the somebody that needs to get out in front of these issues, and we need to educate people and we need to hold our political officials accountable and we need to let them know what needs to be done we need to let them know what we're doing and we have to be proactive and so if you don't want to have happen here what what he's talking about that's happened in europe then get your head out of the sand and go out and not just tell people what they need to do you need to do you need to show you need to network with people you need to get out of your comfort zone and maybe you need to get in your car and leave the farm and go go to these go to these go to the state house get involved in your commodity group whatever it is and if you don't like your commodity group if you don't think they're doing what needs to be done then you need to get involved and you need to change and you need to put your hand up and say this is what you need to do because that's the only way it happens a lot of thing last thing i'll say about this whole deal is 
I don't see the train stopping. Right. There is too there is too many people with too many hands in this thing that want it to work. And the whole climate change movement, there's a lot of people that have fully bought into this and they're gonna dedicate their life to it. And there's a lot of be there's a lot of money to be made on this thing. And when all those factors are working for a specific issue, uh, I don't see it fucking stopping. I don't Man. see it. It's coming no matter what. And so you can either figure out how you can benefit and seize the opportunity or you can get ran over and get fucking left behind. It's and we have what I'm the saying. answers. Far, we are part of the solution. I think that's the thing that gets lost is the American farmer is part of the solution. We're not part of the problem. We just have to, we have to show what we're doing. We have to be willing to explore the possibilities that are out there, but we are the answer. We're not the problem. And yeah. if we can do that, we're all going to profit from it. Yeah, so thousand percent. That's can I get an amen? Amen, brother. <laughs> amen. I don't know, but anyway, that's the best way I can answer that. Yeah. I think that was good. I think that was good. Well, I'm finally warm now. Somebody's going to love that and somebody's going to hate it. Yep, that's, that's a perfect bit. That's what we've heard from just even talking a little bit about it is some people are like, fuck that. That's never fucking coming. I ain't fucking doing that shit, too. That's interesting. I wonder. I kind of want to explore that a little bit. Yep. So you'll have that. But um, anyway, guys, I think that's going to wrap up the show. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, we will be sending out those pork boxes. I'm going to get your guys's, uh, I'm going to email you guys that won those pork boxes. Thank you so much for submitting or submitting a review for the raffle. Continue to do that. Cause we're going to announce another one next month. Um, pay the fee, share it out. We love you guys. We appreciate every single one of you and we'll see you back here next week for another episode. Uh -huh.